My name is Matt Malone, and I'm the Director of Cybersecurity for Vistrata. Today, we're going to be talking about from the dumpster to the front page. And I'm going to be, throughout this, kind of giving you some examples of companies that have done just that, went from a, a dumpster all the way to the front page in not a good way. So more importantly, I'm going to show you how to avoid that fate. So keeping you out of the headlines is a pretty tall order. But the agenda we're going to kind of cover is the main thing is, where's your data? What are your assets? And are you in control of them? That's the overall theme. The other thing is, is are you testing to really know about security or are you just testing to pass a grade? And then finally, we're going to be talking about selling a security culture. The one thing I can say, and this is the most important part, security people should be an ambassador to the rest of the organization from everything from physical all the way to technical. It may not be their job, but we'll kind of get into that. So obviously I'm coming to you virtually, right? So this is the new normal. This is the, the if somebody would have went to an IT administrator or a security person and said, hey, um, you know, two years ago, you're gonna have your teenage kids running around your office, you're gonna, or if you were to even say, we're gonna bring in and let whoever we want into this office, we're gonna let them uh, run gaming networks and maybe download software in the next room next door, IT and security would have freaked out. So where we're at today, there is no such thing as a clean desk policy because everything's out there. So in, in kind of days of old, you used to have you used to have castles and the castles were the protected environment and the villages were generally outside of the castles. So when an attack would happen, everybody would run into the castle, they would close the drawbridge and they would wait it out. It's not the way it is today. Our village is spread out all over the place. So there's a couple key questions that you have to ask yourself are what what kind of security controls do you have in place at those facilities at your homes do you have a shredder in your home do your employees have shredders at their home so let's talk a little bit about what are your assets so assets can be anything a lot of people think that assets are the data in the server or the financial data or you know uh, uh the gold in the, in the gold room, whatever it is that your company considers valuable, we tend to put an asset and claim an asset as a very high value target. So for instance, social security numbers, credit card numbers. But there are other things that you need to be protecting too, things like names and, and phone numbers and emails of employees. Those simple things can kind of lead into a bigger thing. So for instance, uh, I'll give you guys an example. So I had a customer, <laughs> I feel bad for this one, but I had a customer who asked us to do a social engineering test. So we went out, did a zero knowledge, let's see what we can go find. And in their dumpster, they had a phone list. They also had some technical documentation saying that they had a terminal server. So I grabbed the phone list, looked at all the IT administrators because it had their job titles, titles, their roles, where they lived, what their phone number was, what their address was, the whole nine. So I call them up and I said, hey, uh, John, this is, this is Mike. I'm over at uh, Microsoft and we're helping Steven here with doing a terminal server upgrade. Now, are you logged in right now? He says, yes. I say, well, I'll tell you what, I, I need you to log out for a minute. We're gonna move your account to the new terminal server. Which IP address do you normally connect to? Oh, he gives me the IP address. Then I go in and I say, okay, well, uh, you want me to set your password back to your old one? He goes, yeah. So I write down his old password. I said, okay, I'm gonna log into your account, make sure everything's good to go. I log in, I, I couldn't get in. <laughs> so I call the guy back. He goes, oh, you gotta change the port number. The port number is this, right? That little piece of information from a, a phone number and a name led into a breach of their system with full administrator access. So that's the kind of things that you don't think about as assets, right? The other thing is, is uh, you know, we'll secure a, st a server room with a, a badge access or even a fingerprint scanner. We'll secure our offices with keys. The janitor has the keys to the whole building. Have we vetted them? Do we know who they are? Do, are we doing third party risk management? Again, these are the small things that kind of add up into the big things. We'll talk about these a little bit more, but Assets are, are really what you're trying to protect. So I've got a chart here 
with basically all the assets on it, right? And this is just a, a high level overview, but to kind of get you thinking in the mindset of what are assets and where could they possibly be? So we've got a mobile or home office, we've got a corporate office, and we've got the business partner office. Now our data is sitting at all three of these places. At your home, you, you, do, you have, do the people who are working remotely or do the people who are working at their home, do they have a shredder at their facility or at their house? Are they just taking the, the data that they may be creating and throwing it out in the trash with, with just everything else, right? The other, the other kind of aspect of this, and, and when we talk about the corporate office, right, where the data is, is not just the servers, it's not just you know, the laptops and the desktops, but if you're an IT administrator, I want you to think about that closet that nobody goes into, that has all your old equipment, and it's five years old, who cares? It's, it's a low level system, small amount of RAM, nobody would ever want that thing, right? And, and who cares about the data? It's 10 years old. But let me ask you this. Have you or anybody else changed their social security number in the past 10 years? No? If that's the case, then that data is still relevant. And I guarantee you, we're all somewhat guilty of this. If you were to go pull a password from one of those systems and try it in a dictionary attack, their password may have been Ajax1. Now it's Ajax12, right? So that kind of information can kind of help people out. I'll, I'll tell you another story here to talk about kind of this equipment that's out there. And, and two kind of interesting stories. One is you'll see on there old furniture. And that's a weird one. And a lot of people ask me, well, what are you talking about old furniture? And a lot of people right now, a lot of companies are, are getting rid of their offices and they're, they're throwing away their cubicles. There was one time where a company had gotten rid of their cubicles and I, I was actually buying some cubicles for my company. I opened it up and there's a username and a password to an Office Depot account. And I thought, no, there's no way. Sure enough, it logged right in and it gave access. I called the, the people up and I said, hey, just to let you know, you should probably change your password. This isn't probably good. And by the way, don't keep your passwords in the drawer. And we all know somebody at the company that when they go to log in, they can't remember their password. They pull out the drawer and they type in the password. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Hopefully my wife doesn't watch this. Hopefully my wife doesn't see it. But I'll tell you kind of a story. One night we're, we're, she, she's working on her laptop and her computer is very secure with the company that she works with. They have a, a BIOS password. They have, you know, the, uh, you know, username, and password, and then a couple different accesses to get into the system. It was late. She had had a, a glass of wine and she goes, I can't remember my password. Can you hand me my laptop bag? And she pulls out the password list for her laptop that's in the I, as a security guy, I, I cringed. As a husband, I, I felt like a failure. But um, it's one of those things that it can kind of happen. You know, you, you, you just don't connect the dots that if somebody steals the laptop bag and they've got the passwords to the BIOS, it doesn't matter what kind of disk encryption you have, they've already got the access to it. So you may be asking yourself, um, who would dumpster dive me, right? Who, I'm nobody, like why would you dumpster dive me? And, and who's doing this dumpster diving, right? So I'm gonna give you some really strange examples. If you see here, there's, there's three people, Larry Ellison, uh, Bill Gates, and also the, the CEO of Procter & Gamble. All three of those people have actually admitted publicly that their companies went out and dumpster dived to do competitive analysis. So Oracle actually, well, Larry Ellison tells a story where he actually uh, created Oracle from the trash of IBM. He was taking source code from their trash, reading it, looking at it, rewriting it, right? So this kind of stuff happens. If you go to, uh, Kraft got in trouble for this, British Airways got in trouble for this. There's organizations like Pinkerton, PI Now, um, any kind of research company that will tell you that they're really there to help you uh, gain a competitive edge. So if you think about it, these guys are, US-based companies, they're titans of industry, and they're dumpster diving, or their company is. I don't think Bill Gates has jumped in the dumpster. But 
These people have, have went out and hired companies that are, are doing this dumpster driving. So they're doing competitive analysis and they're getting information from their, their other people's dumpsters. So if they're doing it and they're a legal US-based company, what do you think China, Russia, or unscrupulous people are gonna be doing? So that, it's, it's a real thing and it happens, right? Let's talk about ransomware, right? And, and in ransomware and in these attacks that are happening, um, ransomware a lot of time comes in through an email and it's a phishing attempt that they get a hook in you and then they start reeling it in. They start applying more and more and more once they get access and gain access even further and further and further. The difference today in the security realm versus many years ago was before they would get in, do what they could and get, you know, try to get out before they got caught. Now they're staying in the systems forever, as long as they can, slowly reeling it in. These, these companies that you see on the screen here are basically CPI, University of Utah, Colonial Pipeline, that's a big one, right? $5 million payout. CPI, half a million dollar payout. University of Utah, 457,000 payout. UKD is a, a really sad one. Th that was a company, it was a hospital in Germany that had a um, patient coming in and the patient was needed urgent medical care and they could not administer the drugs. They, they basically were in a lockdown because of a ransomware attack. They had to send her off to another hospital and she died en route. A human life was cost from that. Colonial Pipeline, you know, they, they shut down the gas from, from here all, all the way up, uh, from Texas all the way up uh, the East Coast. So that's a pretty big one. Solar winds, we don't even know what solar winds is going to come out to be, what the damages and the ramifications are. Now, the way that, the reason I bring this stuff up is you may be saying, well, ransomware, how, how you get it from a dumpster or, or social engineering or, or a... Um, business email compromise, how do you get that out of a dumpster? Well, the chances are, if you do information gathering, and when I say dumpster, I mean, I want you to kind of get a broader subject. I want you to think about uh, where your data is. So for instance, um, it may be out there on an old website. You may have content that's, if you've ever done Google hacking, where you can type in file type colon XLS space password, it's shocking the amount of Excel documents you will find that have been Google, uh, have, have been picked up by Google and are now in, in Google's uh, searchable database and you can find those passwords. So that kind of stuff is the footprints and the crumbs that we're talking about that build to better attacks, right? So 95% of the security breaches are done by human error, 95%. Well, and, and I can say this, Never in the history that I know of has one computer looked at another computer and said, you know what, I'm gonna attack you. Don't know why, I'm just gonna attack you, I don't like you. Computers don't do that. Humans are usually behind the whole system, right? So 45% of those breaches involved hacking, 17% involved malware, and 22% involved phishing. Now, in the reality, phishing leads to malware, leads to hacking right? So you can basically go from the dumpster all the way up to a full-blown hack. And it's just one piece of the, the puzzle, right? So why is it though that we, we have this belief that it's not going to happen to us? It's not, you know, everybody else is getting breached, they're getting hacked, but you know, we're fine. We're not going to get hacked. Nobody thinks they're going to get hacked until they get hacked. So I read a Times article and I, I put it up here on the screen. Uh, I, I really like uh, this article. It talks about optimistic bias. And in the cybersecurity realm, optimistic bias is a lot of the problem. We think it's not going to happen to us and, oh, I'm just going to do it this one time. Perfect example, texting while driving. We all know that texting while driving is dangerous. It's bad. You can kill, get killed in an instant. We still kind of do it, right? We try not to, we think about it, but you know, it's not, it's okay. It's just a quick text. I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm a good driver. Now I, I put up here, uh, ever eat, try to eat a tiger. Now this is the root of why we have optimistic bias and optimistic bias worked for us 
thousands and thousands of years ago, when you were in a, a village and you had to go chase a saber-toothed tiger down with a little spear and kill him and that was your breakfast, the other five guys who went after him didn't turn out so well. But I'm going to be okay, right? Optimistic bias helps you get out of bed in the morning and say, you know, I'm going to face this thing even though it's a pretty big challenge. So understanding that and understanding the, the reasoning behind that helps to understand the psychology of this and helps to give you a, a view of, of perception versus reality, right? Our perception may be one thing, but the reality is truly another. So Bruce Schneier, if you guys don't know who that is, definitely follow him. He's a, a, a great commentator on cybersecurity. One of his all-time, my all-time favorite quotes of his is, if you think technology can solve your problem, your security problem, then you don't understand the problem and you definitely don't understand the technology, right? If you were to go out and, and talk to the, the people in, in your organization and say, who's in charge of security? There's one of two people. They're going to point to the guy at the front desk with the gun or they're going to point to somebody with a firewall, right? Those are the, the people who are in charge of security. But that isn't necessarily right. You know, everybody's in charge of security. I'll give a couple of examples of, of having kind of this false belief, right? The false belief that technology is going to solve our problems and we're going to be okay and nobody can, can interact. The guy who started LifeLock, now he posted his social security number on the side of a bus and drove it around. And he got hacked 13 times. <laughs> he got identity theft 13 times. Um, the other thing is that uh, you, you think about, to me, the scariest person in all of when you're in the cybersecurity realm is the guy who says, oh, we're good. I've got it. We're totally secure. We don't, we're good. We don't need to test. We're fine. SolarWinds, the reason that they got hacked into was password123. I think it was actually SolarWinds123, but it was basically a very simple password that should have only been on a test server, but test servers, if you put code on a test server, and that code gets moved over to staging and that staging gets moved over to production. If you attack the weakest point, you can take it all the way down the line. So it's important to kind of understand, um, you know, not having, having those false beliefs can be pretty dangerous. So we have all these controls, yet the controls are still failing, right? Now, after World War II, or I'm sorry, after World War I, France decided, no more. <laughs> we are not going to do this trench warfare anymore. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right, and we're going to do it on our terms. So they built the Maginot Line. And if you guys don't know what the Maginot Line is, go look it up. It is amazing. The, it has pillboxes. It has uh, trains that run underground from one section of the Maginot to the other so that they can move and transport troops and tanks, everything, pretty quickly. They have underground bunkers for aircraft. They have an amazing feat of engineering, technology, and they had it in place ready for World War II. And Germany went around to Belgium and they took them. <laughs> so it was a great idea, great concept, but it wasn't covering the whole thing. It just kind of covered a piece of it. It covered Germany because that was their aggressor. They had some stuff on Belgium, but really nothing. And I can say that the Maginot Line did work. When we tried to uh, go from France to Germany, we came up against a very hard conflict when we got to the Maginot Line. Unfortunately, the guns were pointed at us and not at Germany. So there, there's a, if you guys have seen the movie uh, World War Z and the 10th Man, so the 10th man strategy says if nine people agree on a particular course of action, the 10th person must, in context of strategy, take a contrary approach so that all alternatives are considered. I love that approach. I love that idea and that concept because if we all agree with each other and, and we all say, oh, yeah, 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 this is the best plan of action, and there's no real like devil's advocate in the room, that can lead to some pretty big problems. So having that devil's advocate can be a, a, a really good thing. And, and also we'll talk about inclusion and some other stuff as well. 
Um, <laughs> looking at the bigger picture, I love this picture. It's one of my favorites. Um, you can see there in the middle, there's a little security control arm. And uh, you can see from the building that there's a light snow that has fallen. And, and obviously people have driven around the tire track with dry, driven around it. And you get the tire tracks. So what's important to note about this picture is it's actually taken from NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So even they can get it wrong, right? But on paper, this thing looks pretty good. It, it looks great. Okay, well, there's a driveway, there's a parking lot here. We don't want people to park here. We'll put a security gate. And then when you actually kind of look at it in reality, you're like, oh, all right, that was a pretty bad failure. But it's okay. Failures are okay as long as you fix them. Some of the stuff I've talked about, like, do your employees have shredders? Uh, another thing we talked about is, are they disposing of stuff at their house correctly? Um, yeah, another thing we talked about was old servers in the server. Like, what? Janitor's keys? That's not my job. I'm not a custodian. How is that my job? Again, it's from here to here. It may not be your job, but at the end of the day, when the system gets breached and you get hacked into, it's your job, right? So you may be fired because of something that a, a user clicked on because the, the person came in and they, they took a piece of trash, they figured out who they could target, how to communicate to them in an effective manner, the best way to social engineer them. They sent out an email, that didn't work. They sent out another one and this one kind of triggered and now they've got malware on their system and next thing you know the whole system's locked up on ransomware you can say that wasn't your job but you may say it on your, on your way out right so it's it's really important to kind of think about this from the beginning steps and not the end of the day it's easier to catch something when it's small and to eliminate those things and what we're talking about is not super super costly, right? So your data has spread out. It's your electronic footprint for years, websites, uh, maybe they've got your email list, maybe they've got your uh, systems that you use on, maybe you're, they know that you're a Microsoft shop and you maybe have uh, different types of systems that they can access. Maybe they know that you're using Teams, so now that they can call and communicate to your users that, hey, you know, this is Microsoft and calling from Teams. Uh, we noticed that you had a login failure. We just need to reset your password, you know, next thing you know. So again, I'm, I'm trying to get people to think about that, that larger picture, right? And, and there's communication struggles right now. If somebody calls me and says, hey, look, um, you know, I'm from the IT department. There are people that we have hired that I've never met at my company. I've never seen them. Right? I don't know who they are. I, I haven't had a conversation with them because it's been during COVID and we just haven't got to meet face to face. We didn't have a company Christmas party last year. Right. So and that's our, our time to kind of meet and greet. So we have all of these struggles. We have third party contractors who are holding our data and we have access to that data. They have access to full data that can really cripple us. Are we asking them the right questions of how they're securing their stuff? We've all got trust issues. Everyone is a part of security. And this is where I'm, I'm gonna really hone in and really, really talk about it. So in order for us to all be part of security, we really need to understand that you need an army. So everything that I've told you to go kind of look at and think about, you're like, man, you're talking about the internet. You're talking about all this stuff. And like, <laughs> this is an immense amount of work. You're absolutely right. If you were to go do it, you would never have the time to do it. You'd never have the energy, the effort. You just, you would die before you got to the finish line. So inclusion and not, you want inclusion and not exclusive, right? You wanna be, you wanna bring people in there and you wanna be the ambassador to them. So if you ask someone, hey, I just wanted to get your advice. In your department, what do you think just brainstorming. What do you guys think are some security risks that you guys can think of? And let me reward you for those. If you find a security risk, let me reward you. So <clears throat> I'll tell you guys, it's, it's important to have to be the, the let's figure out a solution. Let's figure out more problems. Let's, let's see if we can kind of find some more stuff. 
um, than it is to be the no, you can't do that. No, 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 no. If you're a security guy who says, no, 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 and, and you're the, the cog in the wheel to everything, nobody wants to go to that guy. If you're the guy who helps them figure out a solution and helps them figure out a solution, not figures it out and tells them what they're going to be doing, not forcefully pressing down on them and say, here's the way it is, but, but includes them in the conversation, brings them to the table, lets, lets them see your side of the conversation so that they can help you better strategize, right? Include these people, bring them in. That right there is going to be more valuable than anything you can ever imagine. So how do we fix this stuff, right? <laughs> we, we've been talking a lot, a lot of stuff, we're talking about a lot of tall orders. Um, we're talking about a lot of loose information out there. <clears throat> so one thing is, is knowing your digital footprint. And again, using everybody to kind of do that. Um, doing it yourself, you're, again, it's gonna be really hard, but doing a collective conversation with people, um, making it fun. So <laughs> again, my wife, the company she works for is very secure and I, I, I definitely appreciate that. And she's, uh, she's now become like a rock star of, of the security awareness stuff because she, she usually gets pretty good scores on them because she kind of has a husband who's in cybersecurity. <clears throat> but she, um, she loves when she does a social engineering and they send a, an email and they say, hey, you know, and she clicks on it and, and notifies them that, hey, this is a problem. And it goes, cha-ching, you did a great job. And she actually loves that stuff. She likes that reward system. So knowing your digital footprint, helping having the users to help you get there, right? Uh, where, where do you think some of our data is? What do you think data that is critical could be? Let's do a thought experiment about that. Let's do a round table around that. Bringing in management and talking about that. So, and in order to do that, you gotta think outside the box, you gotta think on down the line. So we talked about over here where a, a piece of trash turns into a social engineering or a phishing experiment uh, more apt and then comes into a full-blown malware and, and ransomware attack so you got to think about it from that perspective is like well what is this data and does it really need to be out there can we limit some of these things and, and how are some ways that we can do that so thinking about the whole way and again building an army and training them I, there was a, a boss that I had several 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 years ago and he would train a bunch of people and then eventually they would leave, you know, and somebody asked him, he's like, why do you keep sending these guys to training when they're going to leave? And he goes, well, would you rather I didn't train them and they stayed? <laughs> you know, you, you got to train people. You got to make it security aware. So uh, security is unfortunately top of mind. It has to be top of mind. You got to kind of bring it up in fun ways, exciting ways, posters, uh, emails, you know, whatever it is to kind of slowly kind of push them into it and again bring them part of it so and i'll i'll say this before i before i go off that slide so you know a, a reward program can be a very incentivizing right it, it helps to to bring the person in and say hey if you run into a, a better idea a better way to do this stuff let me know and if you do so i'll give you a give you a prize 50 bucks or whatever so uh, I'll tell a story, and this actually had to do with whiteout. So the typist up in Dallas, Texas, was trying to figure out um, a better way because every time they'd make a mistake, they'd have to kind of start over. So she tried to figure out a way to, to cover it up, and she invented a thing called whiteout. Whiteout led to, uh, it was uh, Michael Nesbeth, it was his mom that did that. The Michael Nesbeth, when he got the fortune from his mom, um, he was obviously one of the monkeys, and then he ended up creating MTV. So a small little reward program, it was that that then created um, that aspect. When we talk about training, testing, and making aware, I want people to kind of think about fire drills for schools, and let's just take it down to a simple principle, right? Fires in schools used to be a very bad thing and, and it was killing kids. They weren't prepared. They didn't know where to go. They didn't, you know, they didn't know how many kids were missing, right? So then they started really putting into the schools this program of teaching them, doing fire drills. So you line these kids up and you say, okay, fire drills coming. You have a job. Your job is to know that Johnny's in front of you and Mary's behind you. Johnny's in front of you and Mary's behind you. And where's Johnny? Now all of a sudden you go find Johnny. Now you go out to the, to the red flagpole, right? So that 
training over and over and over and over has made it super safe in America for, for school fires, right? Now let's take it to a little bit more of a, an adult approach, right? Um, when the Navy SEALs went to go uh, uh, find Osama bin Laden, they didn't just like drop the helicopter in and go, okay, let's go look over here and see if he's there. They knew there's 15 steps to here. There's gonna be a right turn. There's gonna be a door. We're going to, and they, they trained over and over and over. They built what's called a shoot house out in California that was a replica of that building. And they practiced it over and over and over and over. And when they finally went in, a helicopter failed on them, but they were still able to complete the mission because they, they, they were ready. They knew the different scenarios. They knew what was gonna happen and they knew how to address it. So that training, going back to simple, going back to testing, training, and making aware, that simple stuff that you learned as a kid, believe it or not, will help you today. Building those scenarios. So how do you do that? Right, you should be doing some security awareness, you should be doing some social engineering, and you should be testing, right? So in order to test, and I, I had a customer who called me a, a while back and they said, well, actually, let me rephrase that. They were a potential customer. They were thinking about hiring us. And the guy called me and said, look, I, I, I need a test. I need a vulnerability test, um, but I need it to pass. What? <laughs> you, you don't need a vulnerability test if you're just wanting it to pass. I mean, it's like saying, I want the degree, but I don't want to go to the courses. You can have the degree, but you're still not going to know anything about it, right? So I, I'm not that guy. I'm not going to do a test just so you can pass. You should be doing a test to fail. You want to, you want to try and find as many problems as you can because you can fix them. And if you happen to pass, well, good for you. Kudos. Dig a little deeper too, <laughs> right? Because there's always a failure in the system somewhere. But it's, uh, it's important to kind of understand how to do that testing, right? Um, also, is there a human element in it? So a lot of people say, well, we have this technology and it runs against the scans. Da, 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 da. Okay, in the previous slide, we talked about how many of those things are human error. 95% are human error. And if your testing is 100% technology driven, you got a problem, right? So knowing the risks can literally make all the difference in the world. If you, if you know, if, you know, if you're, if you're going to be taking a boat out, you might want to check the weather right before you go. Because if you don't know the risk that you're getting into, you might be sailing right into a hurricane. That's problematic. And I can guarantee this, and I, I know that every salesperson says this, but a cost of an assessment is cheaper. It's a fraction, pennies, to the cost of an incident response, 100%. Um, I, had a, I had a customer up in, up in New York, they called me, they said, um, hey, we need you to we need some help on an incident response. And I said, okay, I flew up there immediately. And they were losing thousands of dollars every like half an hour. So it was just incredible the amount of money that they were losing. And what it was, was it was a server that they didn't know about that was, oh, well, that's an old, it's an old server. Nobody uses it. It's just kind of, we need to get rid of it, but we haven't yet. Well, that server, <laughs> was the jumping point for the attacker who then got into the system and just killed everything else. But they didn't even know that on none of their network diagrams was that was that server anywhere on there. Nowhere was it listed on their vulnerability scans. Nowhere was it listed on their on their their network maps or talked about in a meeting. So finding that server would have been way more inexpensive. Now the hard part is it's hard to tell whether you know, that is going to lead to, if you fix the problem, then, you know, nobody cares. Security is a hard life. If we do our job, we're a waste of money. If we don't do our job, we're a failure, right? We're like car insurance. Nobody, nobody wants it until they need it. And then they're happy to have it. So to perform a test, and, and I'm kind of going to describe, so in social engineering, when I think about a social engineering test, I start out with defining the assets and then figure out ways to better protect those assets. So I, I also, the other key element of this is I wanna, I wanna talk to the, the uh, end users and I wanna build out 
a test program that works for them. Now, I don't want to make them look stupid. That's not at all it, because if you do that, your test is going to fail. Your test is to make them aware that, oh man, this could happen. I used to go, when I do a social engineering test on a company to see if I could get in without a badge, right? Don't ever go through the front door. That receptionist will tear you up. <laughs> it's hard to get past her. But if you walk back to the docks in a suit and you say, hey, excuse me, I left my badge inside. Could you let me in through the shipping department? Nine times out of 10, go ahead, buddy. I actually had a company out in California that uh, hired me to do a social engineering test. And I got all the way into the facility. I bet the guy, the salesperson, that, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to get in there to the room. And he was laughing and I didn't know why. So we bet $100. I, I, I go in, I get all the way through the building and I get up to the IT department. And I love grabbing the, uh, the fire exit map because it kind of shows you where everything is. And I get all the way to the IT department and I realize the meeting is in the server room. It's a big glass server room. So I get up and as I'm walking towards it, the other guy just badged in and opens the door. And I said, oh, hey, I left my badge over there in my bag. Uh, can I go grab it? And he's like, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. I walk in, that was the IT manager who hired me. He didn't know that I was a social engineer who just came in and <laughs> he had just led into the server room, right? And when I sit down, he goes, oh man, this is gonna be an interesting test, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is, but it's okay. It's okay. So don't make them feel stupid, make them feel like a part of it. So we're also gonna do a, a test on a wide variety of controls. So not just you know technology controls, but those, those controls are gonna be things like physical, um, information control, employer response, right? Uh, policy adherence. And, and anytime you do one of these tests, I can tell you, um, notify uh, the corporate security, notify the people in management so that they know what's going on because you'll start, to, if, if the employees start to call up, that's great. We're glad to know that, but we don't want it to go to a, you know, SWAT team situation, right? <laughs> so we're also gonna base on a wide base of control. So we're gonna talk to reception, contractors, um, you know, third party organizations, all kinds of stuff. And we're gonna, we're gonna go through that. Uh, and, and what I think the benefit is, is that you're gonna, you're gonna find that you're gonna get security awareness, right? There's nothing more valuable than that person who goes, oh man, you know that guy, I, I, I thought he was, maybe it was him, but they ended up stopping attacker. So if you're doing this and they're, they're now, it's a cat and mouse game, they're looking to catch you, right? So they know that these security awareness tests happen. They may not catch you, but they may catch somebody who's actually doing it. And, and, and hopefully they do catch you. So I oftentimes, if somebody, like if I walk into a building and I'm doing a test where I'm trying to get in the server room, somebody says, excuse me, who are you? I go, congratulations. I give them a little prize. I, I give them a note telling them exactly what I'm doing and who to contact in their um, office to let them know that this is just a test. And then I ask them, hey, look, don't, don't spread this around. We're doing a cybersecurity test. Here's what's going on. Um, th that awareness will last for months. Those people will always be diligent. And then when you come to give the results to the organization, don't limit it to just the IT department. Show other people, show other people how this happened. You don't have to put them on, on you know, front street and blast them out, but do put it out there that, hey, look, a guy came in and, and was able to sit in our offices or was able to um, you know, elicit information from our receptionist. This is stuff that happens and it was, it's better to have it happen as a test than it is as a reality. So the other thing is it's gonna do is it's gonna you know, assess the risks of well, how easy was that to get into, how hard was that to get into. Now, you've done all this testing, we've now figured out our digital footprint, we know what's going on. Now we gotta sell it to our management, right? Because if this is what we wanna do, we wanna start doing these tests. And I can tell you this, social engineering, uh, phishing, those sorts of tests are way cheaper than most things. They're super easy a lot of times. If you need to slap posters around your facility that talks about the cybersecurity risks and loose lips sink ships, it doesn't cost you more than a poster. Just try it. Build out social engineering programs to where you now have an army of people. Now, the way to sell this is a couple different ways. When you go to talk to your bosses, think like an MBA and not a CISP. Don't think like a security guy because they're business people. 
And when you come to them, you do have to talk to them about risks, but you also have to talk to them about advantages. So if you talk to them about advantages and you teach them like, hey, look, here are some of the risks that we have. Now, here's the cost of it if it happens. And here's the, the amount that it would cost to fix it. Now, there are some other options that we can do, which are smaller programs like security awareness with posters, or we can do um, internal social engineering, right? There's a lot of different ways to kind of test those things and to, to build that out and to talk to your senior management. The other thing is through communication and awareness, right? Again, talking to the people in the different organizations and giving them challenges to kind of think about stuff and bring you back with solutions, let them make it fun. Let them make it part of their job because everybody has a role and responsibility in security, whether it's keeping their laptop safe, whether it's keeping their data safe, whether it's keeping a customer's data safe, we all have a job in security. And if you don't, if they don't know that, you've got a bigger problem than that. So training and education, and then also giving roles and responsibilities, but also testing. So doing a small test can lead to bigger tests later, right? If you show the CEO, <laughs> I, I actually had another test where, that we did where we, uh, we went into this, basically they, they challenged me to go to the CEO's office, right? And to have a, a sit down meeting with him. Um, and, and we did that. We showed that they, we were able to bypass pretty much all the security controls and get into his office and have that conversation with him when he came in. Um, it was very awkward, but at the same time, he, they knew him well enough that they, they knew that we could do the test. But that actually kind of sparked his interest to go, you know what, if this can happen to me, this can happen to anybody. So uh, the other thing is vulnerability testing, pen testing, all of those things lead into kind of showing senior management, like, look, here are the risks. And again, don't be afraid of actually having a bad score or to have a failure on there. Understand that anytime you have a, a vulnerability test or a pen test or a risk assessment that has results, those are things you can go fix. And I can guarantee you, if you have a perfect score with no problems, you might wanna check that out. <laughs> there's, no, there's no perfect people, right? It, there's no perfect systems. The, the most secure system is a system that doesn't exist. So with that, we'll open up the Q&A. And again, my name is Matt Malone, and I'm with Vistrata Security as the director.